All right. Hello again, and welcome once again to Virtual Victorian Days. I hope that you're having fun. I've been kind of playing along at home uh, in between coming to you with some steampunk science today. So um, I hope that you are just enjoying all the amazing content from all these great volunteers and folks. I can't wait to see what else we have planned. Anyway, my name is Sandy Roberts. Hello. I am a science, technology, engineering, math, maker, art, craft, educator. Um, and I do all kinds of programs all over the area. Um, so I am also the owner of Kaleidoscope Enrichment. One second. Um, so I'm also the owner of Kaleidoscope Enrichment, and um, my website, kaleidoscopeenrichment.com, has lots of projects for you. So if you miss anything today or it goes too fast, just head on over to the website and you'll be able to get all the information there. Um, I am also the Makerspace Coordinator for the Warren County Library System, and I do free projects all the time. So make sure you check that out because we've got a lot of neat stuff happening every single week online. And if that's not enough, the Big Book of Maker Camp Projects, that's my book. It's got over 100 different items that you can do. Um, one second. I am just going to see if I can mute. Um, we seem to be getting, I don't know if you guys are hearing it. I'm getting a little bit of sound. Anyway, um, so today we are talking steampunk science. Let's, uh, let's lay down some guidelines here. We're going to talk a little bit about history and fun things like that. And then I've got some fun projects for you after. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to just give you a little bit of background and some fun projects along the way. Let's switch over. Okay. So, steampunk science. What the heck is steampunk? Okay. <laughs> now, steampunk is really just about um, reimagining history, specifically history from the Victorian era. Um, so steampunks like to take all kinds of the amazing industrial age that the Victorians were living and kind of make science fiction and fantasy and um, fashion out of it. So when I say steampunk science, I'm asking you to reimagine what you could do with science. Okay. Um, it's a little distracting. <laughs> that I am hearing um, others. Give me one second here. I'm trying to kind of just try and figure this out. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with that. I seem to be unable. Let's see. I don't want to mute my audio. Um, one second. I'm sorry, folks. I'm just going to see if I can mute the. I don't seem to be able to mute them, and I don't think they realize that I can hear them. That's because you guys are actually coming through on the audio. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Got that kind of figured out. All right. So. Back to our steampunk science. Um, probably the most important thing that was figured out during the Victorian times was electricity, okay? Electricity was obviously something people knew about. They've seen lightning. They've had static electricity. If you've ever walked across a carpet with your socks on, you've probably felt it. Um, but Thomas Alva Edison was the first to be able to harness that electricity into a current and make the first light bulb. This was a huge revolution because gas lamps, while they'll light your house, they can also set your house on fire. And a lot of people didn't lose their homes and businesses that way. So the electric lamp made a safer alternative and allowed people to work at night and host parties and factories to be open and all kinds of things like that. It totally changed the world. He also developed what we call direct current, which is the kind of current that batteries use. So things like your cell phone and um, you know anything that uses a battery, that's using direct current. And he's the one that kind of came up with that. It became very popular in the US and we still use it today. Problem is it doesn't work with um, really high or low voltages and you can't really change it easily, which brings us to another 
famous Victorian scientist, Nikola Tesla. He and Edison kind of got into a really serious competition in the 1880s. We call it the battle of the currents because Tesla came up with alternating current. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of specifics there, but the idea was that it could transform from high to low voltages very easily. That's the kind of current that we use when you plug into the wall. Okay, so it's very popular. But at the time, DC current is what people were more into. And so Nikola Tesla didn't get as much praise as, you know, Edison and didn't have as much commercial success. Nikola really focused, however, on figuring out how to transfer energy without wires. He envisioned a world where everybody could have electricity in their homes, no matter where they were, without having costly wires. Um, and that's what he worked on. Now, he never fully realized that vision, but he did come up with some really amazing technology. Now, if you at home want to play with electricity, you can do so safely. Um, if Again, if you go to my website, I have lots of projects where you can learn to hack little tea lights, and you can learn to hack toothbrushes, and make robots, and make light up circuits, um, and light up origami, and fun things like that. So I encourage you to go to the dollar store, get some items like this, and hack them to get the batteries and motors out of them, and design your own uh, circuits. That's very steampunk. All right, moving along. We are coming to you over the internet. Computers are such a huge part of our world now. Well, we owe a lot of that to Charles Babbage. He is often called the father of the computer because he invented the first mechanical computer. Didn't even use electricity, okay? This is pretty amazing. The whole thing was basically uh, physical switches that could be used to um, basically do really complex math. Um, his original uh, difference engine, okay, was then transformed into the analytical engine. Now, at first, he was really just focused on doing complex math, but his assistant, Ada Lovelace, saw something bigger. She was an amazing mathematician and writer because her husband or her um, father was a poet, um, but she saw the analytical engine and said, you know what? We can use this for more than just calculation, and she came up with the first algorithm. An algorithm is basically a pattern for computers that tells them how to do something. So she was able to take her mathematical knowledge, develop an algorithm, a path or a pattern for this mechanical computer to follow, and basically invented coding. Okay, so if you want to be like Ada, hourofcode.org, go online and learn coding. Again, come see me at the library. I have Hour of Code every Monday. You can come and learn and be just like Ada. Which brings me to Alan Turing. Turing. Now, technically not a Victorian because his work was done in, you know, like 1912. But he took everything that Babbage and Lovelace did and came up with the first real electric computer. Um, and you can see a picture of it here. I wanted to point to it on my screen like you could see that. Um, so he is generally considered the um, father of computer science and artificial intelligence. So if you've got an Alexa or, you know, um, sitting around the house, you owe it to Alan Turing, okay? Very, very cool guy. And I will say both Ada Lovelace and Alan Turing did not get as much praise and recognition during their lives as they probably should have. Ada, because um, she was a woman and Alan because he was gay. So that was unfortunately the way things were. Aren't you glad that now we listen to everybody's contributions? Okay, I'll get off my high horse on that one. Moving on to Alexander Graham Bell. You've probably heard of this guy before, Scotsman, who invented the first telephone, which is amazing because I don't know about you, but I've got one of these. This is based on his work. Um, so this changed everything. Suddenly people could talk to one another over long distances. And as you know, that's a pretty important invention, but it was based on the telegraph created by these guys, um, William Cook and Charles Wheatstone. They actually came up with the first telegraph system and it had like five needles, each of which used magnetism to basically, if you pushed a needle on one side, it would travel, the electricity would travel over a wire to another setup and through um, magnetic means, and I'm not gonna go into it, basically tap that other um, wire. Now, they got it down to five keys, okay? And again, 
This was before the telephone. It was the first way to be able to communicate over long distances other than letters. It was instantaneous communication. It was so important for the military, so important for industry, but it was really complicated to use the way that they had it set up. And you had to have like five wires for each one. So it was expensive. Enter Samuel Morse and Morse code. All right. Morse code, dots and dashes on and off. This meant one wire instead of five. And it was so much quicker to be able to send messages. It made the whole telegraph um, something that was used literally by every country in the world. Um, and Samuel Morse is very much the reason for that. In a little bit, I'm going to show you how to use this to make yourself a very lovely fashion item. Okay. Taking a quick look at the time. We're good. Now, if you were with me this morning at 11, we talked a lot about recorded sound. We talked about entertainment and music. Um, and that is super important. Um, so what I wanted to just recap really quickly, Thomas Edison, again, smart guy, invented the very first phonograph and figured out how to record sound and play it back. Huge. But it wasn't until Emil Berliner figured out that you could make discs instead of cylinders to mass produce music. And suddenly by 1906, everybody had to have a gramophone in their, their house. Everybody wanted records that they could share music all across the world. Um, and without that very invention, we wouldn't have a music industry like we do today. And I don't know about you, but I like my music. Um, <laughs> all right, transportation. This is huge. Um, keep in mind that before steam um, transportation, most people pretty much stayed within a couple miles of their home. They didn't travel to other countries. They didn't even travel across this country. But in the Victorian age, we saw the invention of the stagecoach, which we wouldn't think of high technology, but it certainly was for the time. It was basically the, you know, the early bus where people could pay a small fee, get in a vehicle and travel for new jobs and opportunities to see family. Um, it was huge. It, it changed a lot of things. It also made it possible to transport goods. And remember, this is the age of the Industrial Revolution where suddenly people are making all these different products and selling them all across the world. Canals were constructed during this time. We have many canals in our area. Um, and in fact, next year, hopefully Park Fest will be back. The Morris Canal made New Jersey an economic center. Um, and then steamships were probably one of the most important. Now you could travel more easily between Britain and the U.S. You could ship goods. Um, Steamships also were really important for the military. Now, if you want to learn more about the steam engine and how all that works, tomorrow at three, I've got a some uh, workshop on steam powered, and we'll go into all the specifics. Um, again, really important, the train, the steam locomotive. Basically, now we could lay down tracks, thousands of miles of tracks were laid down, and you could travel anywhere. But more importantly, you could ship logs and rocks and manufactured goods anywhere across the country. Those railways were really important and it led to transportation becoming cheap and easy and eventually people being able to take trains. Now you could go anywhere um, fairly easily and inexpensively. First commercial steam locomotive was uh, 1812 by Blinkenskop, but families like Blair, families like Stevens here in New Jersey they took this technology and, again, drove the economy of our area and their famous families to this day for all the amazing work that they did. And, of course, the first cars. Now, we typically think of cars as coming around in the 1920s. That's when Henry Ford figured out how to mass produce cars more easily. But the very first cars were around in 1886, thanks to uh, Carl Benz. Benz might sound familiar to you, right? That company is still around and making really amazing cars called Mercedes-Benz. This company's still here. Um, but he put together the first car. You can see it's actually a tricycle with a steam-powered engine, which is pretty cool. That's pretty punk. You know what I love the most? His daughter, Bertha, was his primary driver, and she's the one that figured out all the controls and helped him engineer a better driving experience. So the first cars, also Victorian. All right. 
Now, I'm a biologist, so of course I have to bring up the natural world. Charles Darwin was a Victorian. He traveled on these steamships to islands all across the world. And as he did so, he took detailed journals of what he saw. He drew everything, he wrote it down, and eventually came to the conclusion that natural selection, okay, was driving evolution, was driving the change of one species to the next. And he laid down the idea that we were all connected from, you know, origin species. And he wrote a book, super famous, called The Origin of Species. Very controversial stuff, super controversial. But now after a lot of testing, it's a widely accepted um, theory. So the theory of evolution and natural selection came from Charles Darwin. What I find really interesting about the natural sciences is remember how I mentioned Ada Lovelace? Her contributions were kind of, you know, tamped down and ignored and often not attributed to her because she was a woman. Well, the biological sciences and the life sciences, and particularly things like botany, were one of the sciences that women were encouraged to pursue because it was considered very healthy to get outdoors and painting lovely botanicals was considered a very womanly art. So some of the best botanists of the Victorian era were all women, including Margaret Rebecca Dickinson. Okay. She made these amazing paintings. She studied orchids um, particularly and created a collection of over a thousand specimens that are still available right now in the British Museum. She is probably one of the most prolific um, botanists of the time. And her amazing detailed paintings, a skill she would have picked up as a gentlewoman, are actually part of the reason that she is so revered today because she captured all these details of these plants in a scientific way. Oddly enough, I cannot find a single painting or photo of her. It's always of her work. Hmm. Mary uh, Anning is another really famous female scientist. She also studied botany, but she was really into paleontology. She found some of the early fossils and cataloged those fossils in England, and she became very well known and was, is one of the few that was actually um, accepted into the Royal Society of Scientists for her work. Um, she particularly focused on marine fossils. Now, if you want to be a scientist and want to find some fossils of your own, Big Brook Parks. Um, you can go and find marine fossils there by going through the river. Look it up online because you can be a paleontologist too, just like Mary. Okay, so that's kind of a little overview. I could go on for days. I didn't even touch on astronomy. There is so much science and innovation that happened during the Victorian period because of that industrial revolution. It literally changed the world. And that's why I think we're all still so fascinated by it. So. Why don't we get to a fun project? I am going to, okay, where's my thing? <laughs> I've got a lot of cameras going. All right, coming over here, remembering to take my microphone with me this time. All right, here's what we need for our project. We are gonna take Morse code. Now, Morse code, you can actually replicate just by tapping. So for example, Many people know the famous SOS, um, which is an alert call, a, a distress call. And if you look here on our, and again, this will be on my website, three short dots, um, three long dashes, three short dots. The way this works is that a dot is a quick beat. That's an S. Whereas a dash is longer. So, all right, so... Three short beats. And that's SOS. They would, on a telegraph, actually tap that out. And very, very uh, astute people would listen and be able to write that down. Okay. This is still used today, by the way, just so you know. We are going to, however, make a visual representation of this. So here we go. Ooh, my microphone is being a little bit funky for me. So you're gonna take your sheet, which again is on my website, or you can Google it. Um, Morse code is available um, pretty widely. And I've got some beads, which I'm just gonna spread around here. Now I was feeling very steampunk and Victorian this morning. So I'm using some silver and gold beads that I have and a pipe cleaner. 
And if I wanted to make, say, an SOS bracelet, or if I want to spell out my name, I could. I would just take one, two, three, checking on my time because I don't want to go over. So I would just put three beads. I would decide that gold are my dots. Feed them on there. A clear bead as a spacer, so I know that I've ended my letter. I'm going to use silver as my dash. And another spacer. And three more dots for another S. And now I have a secret message on my bracelet. Let's see if I can do this. Can I do this with one hand? I can't. Okay, here we go. Okay, and then I could just trim that. Now maybe because I'm a steampunk, I like to imagine that I'm an intelligentsia and that this is my special bracelet that lets people know that I'm in trouble and I need their help. Um, so maybe you can make up a backstory for your secret code bracelet. It's also really fun to make as a gift or um, for your family. You can spell out each other's names. You can spell out secret messages. Very easy to do and all based on the very, very important Morse code created by Samuel Morse during the Victorian era. Okay, coming over to this camera. Here we go. All right, that's about all the time we have. Thank you so much for uh, visiting me for virtual Victorian days. Tomorrow I've got two more programs, so make sure you come back and check those out. And my daughter is doing a steampunk chibi drawing tutorial tomorrow too. So that's really fun if you're into art. Um, once again, I'm Sandy Roberts. My business is Kaleidoscope Enrichment. Check out my website for more fun projects and for programs that I'm hosting in the area because I would love to learn with you. Um, and if you need more, the Big Book of Maker Camp projects is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and it has fun projects like how to make cosplay items out of foam and other fun to e and easy to find objects. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great day and I will see you tomorrow.